So today, the resurrection is what we're looking at. And let's start with a little Bible study. So open up your Bibles uh, to Acts chapter 17. You guys know Acts chapter 17. We've talked about it a little bit or made reference to it. This is Paul in Athens. But this is a good time to uh, pull out a couple applications, or, or just, I should say, this is a good time to make a couple observations uh, from the passage uh, because of the topic we're going to talk about today, which is on the resurrection. Paul, you know, he's in the midst of his missionary journeys, <clears throat> and he's, uh, he's just been booted out of, uh, I guess, Berea and Thessaloniki before that, and so he's waiting um, for his friends to come join him in Athens, and while he's doing that, you, you can see in verse, chapter 17, verse 16, that he's walking around and he's distressed because he sees all these idols in the city. And then, so I want to make three observations uh, that are going to be relevant for us, and I'll just give you the first one uh, up here. Because I think this is relevant for, if we want to engage culture, if we want to think about how to change culture, I think we can learn a lot from Paul's speech here to the Greeks in Athens. And the first thing that he does, is, that we'll see here, is he affirms that which can be affirmed. So look at verses 22 and uh, 23. So Paul stands up. Paul then stood up at the meeting of the Areopagus and said, Men of Athens, I see that in every way you are very religious. <clears throat> For as I walked around and looked carefully at your objects of worship, I even found an altar with this inscription, To an unknown God. Now what you worship as something unknown, I'm going to proclaim to you. So it's interesting, this phrase in verse 23, the, in the NIV it's look carefully. Uh, it means... It's looking at something again and again. It has the idea of meticulously going out and examining uh, things. And so what's interesting is Paul didn't just sort of happen across this altar, but Paul went out looking for it. He meticulously looked over and over again, and he finds this altar. And when he was doing this, he would have also heard or probably knew about a deadly plague that struck Athens 500 years before this. Uh, this, have you heard of the plague in Athens? It took place 429 B.C. You can read about it in uh, a historian named Thucydides. But anyway, so there's this plague that, that hit the city uh, 500 years ago. And what happened was the people in Athens uh, prayed to all these gods, trying to appease the gods. And they prayed to different gods, and the plague wouldn't leave. And finally, one of their poets uh, at the time, a guy named Epimenides, said, well, why don't you offer sacrifices to the, to the unknown god? And so they set up this altar to an unknown god. They prayed to it, and the plague stopped. And so Paul would have known this as he's walking around. And now here he is, 500 years later, and he says, let me tell you who that god is who stops the plague. Let me tell you who that is. And so that's the first thing, is he's affirming uh, that which can be affirmed. Okay, the second observation that we, can, that we can make as we look at his speech here is he outflanks their thinking. <clears throat> and I actually, I mentioned this when I went off on a tangent yesterday, but we've, so we've seen this where, um, remember these three great questions that, that philosophers have been asking since the beginning of philosophy. What is life? What is motion? And what is being? And so Paul knows this, and he's a, he's a student of his culture, and so he outflanks them. He says, let me tell you the, the answer to these questions that have plagued you since the beginning of philosophy. God is the fundamental reality that explains all these realities. You know, it's in him that we live and move and have our being. And so you get, you get this, uh, the, the part that we won't read since I, I kind of talked about it yesterday, but uh, verses 24 all the way to 28. That is, that is a brilliant um, way to outflank their thinking. He's, he's a quoting from their own poets. He's a, he's a, earlier he talks about Epicurus and, and um, uh, Zeno, or who, who is it? Somebody. Um, some of their own philosophers. And so... He's outflanking their thinking here, and it's a brilliant way. He's a student of their culture. But then what he does, third, is he confronts their rank idolatry. So he confronts their idolatry. And so look at verse uh, 30. Let's see, actually 29 to 32. 
So what he does here, beginning in verse 29, Paul's going to break in the conversation and he's going to take it out of the orbit of the world that was familiar to them, this world that has been created by a God and things like that, and he's going to move it into the orbit of the biblical worldview. And so that's what he does beginning in verse 29. He says, Therefore, since we are God's offspring, we should not think that the divine being is like gold or silver or stone, an image made by man's design and skill. In the past, God overlooked such ignorance, but now he commands all people everywhere to repent. For he has set a day when he will judge the world with justice by the man he has appointed. And he has given proof of this to all men by raising him from the dead. Now you might read this, and with our Christian sort of uh, mindset, this doesn't sound like such a radical thing. But you, you need to understand the context of this passage. So where is Paul? He's in Athens. He's specifically in the Areopagus. And he's speaking to them, and, he's, and so uh, in verse 30, he begins to, like I said, move it into the orbit of the biblical v- worldview, and he begins to, um, to communicate the fact that God is a God that you're personally accountable to, that you're morally accountable to, and that's something that's very different to the Greek mindset. And then he says something that's actually audacious in the context of where he's saying it. And he says, this God has sent a man who is appointed, and the proof of this is that he's raised him from the dead. Now, why is, that, um, why is that striking here? Well, it's striking because the, the mythical founding of the Aragopagus, you can read about the mythical founding of it in one of these, uh, in a Greek tra- uh, play, a Greek tragedy, um, by a guy named Aeschylus. He wrote a, a series of, a trilogy of plays called the Oresteia um, Cycle. And in that, you read about the mythical founding of the Aragopagus. And in this mythical founding of the Aragopagus, we hear Apollo give a speech the god Apollo. And Apollo says in his speech, he says, once a man dies, he shall never raise again. Once he sheds his blood, he shall never raise again. Now we have 500 years later, Paul standing in the very place where Apollo gave the speech. And he says, look, if, if so, nobody rises, to dead, rises from the dead, well, then who was that that spoke to me on the road to Damascus? He's proclaiming a risen Christ. And it's, it's actually one of my favorite sort of history of idea connections between uh, the Greek sort of uh, writings and scripture there. Unbelievable. So there's Paul saying that. And so what he's doing, he's confronting their rank idolatry. So we have this kind of three-step thing, affirm, outflank, and confront. And of course the resurrection is front and center in the confronting of rank idolatry in their midst. So it's pretty cool, I think. And uh, I love this speech. It's what, you know, the Mars Hill speeches, there's so much there. Uh, I love this quote as well by N.T. Wright. You've got this in your structure notes, I think, yeah. Affirmation, confrontation, and outflanking. If you want to interact with and transform your culture, study the Aragopagus speech and see how Paul went about his task. I think he's absolutely right. Then go and do likewise, if you dare. Affirm what can can and should be affirmed. Confront what can and must be confronted and outflank that which is looking in the right direction, but which then turns back and settles for second best. I think that's a great sort of way to think about, you know, when we engage culture. What can we infirm? You know, there's obviously, because of common grace, there's many things that are good in our culture. There's many things that are good in all of our lives. But then, of course, we need to confront, right? We need to confront thinking and, and idolatry, and we need to outthink, outflank uh, a lot of times thinking. And a lot of the tools, a lot of things we've been talking about this week are, are, are tools that are going to help you to do that, I hope and I pray. But of course, uh, in confronting the rank idolatry of others, we need to get to Jesus. And that's what Paul does in this speech, right? We need to get to Jesus. And when you get to Jesus, we need to get to this resurrection. Uh, for if Jesus didn't raise from the dead, then Christianity is truly, is not unique among all the religions. But if he did raise from the dead, then Christianity is truly unique in the face of all religions. Okay? And so that's why, and so Keller says uh, on page 210 of, of the book that we're reading, he said, if the resurrection happened, it changes our lives completely. It changes everything. And that's absolutely right. If the resurrection happened, it changes everything. You guys know that. There's a passage in Paul in 1 Corinthians 15. You know, if the resurrection didn't happen, then our faith is futile. And so today, we are going to spend the whole two hours uh, debating or or just showing what is the evidence uh, that the resurrection actually happened. And the thing is, we've actually done a lot of the work. Uh, You know, if God exists, 
Well, then a res you know, raising from the dead, that's, that's not impossible because miracles are possible. We've looked at the New Testament evidence, so we have good reason to think that we have an historically reliable account. So we've done a ton of the work. Now we just kind of need to go one step further and assess that evidence and ask what is the best explanation for the evidence before us, okay? So that's what we'll do today. Uh, can I pray for us? And we'll jump in. Okay. Jesus, good afternoon. Uh, Lord, it's uh, pretty amazing to think we're coming to an end here in this class, and we've actually covered a ton of ground and we thank you for that, Lord. I pray that we would um, have not only learned a lot uh, up to this point, but that we would be growing in our hearts and our desire to worship you and just our awe of your majesty and your glory. And Lord, I thank you uh, that you have, in fact, raised from the dead. And that, Lord, we worship a living God and uh, a dying and a rising God. And what a privilege, uh, what a joy um, to follow you. And we can because it's true, because it really happened. And so, Lord, I pray that you just um, give us ears to hear today as we think through the evidence, as we walk through how to engage people in discussion on this stuff, and uh, just pray that you would also nourish our hearts. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, um, just for practice, I see on the top of your structure notes for today, you guys should be really good at this. So we won't discuss with your neighbor, but um, one, somebody just, how would we uh, answer skeptic number one? We've already talked about this, so let's just review. I have trouble believing all the miracles in the Bible. Quick response. Somebody, what would you do? It would be a couple quick responses. I Okay. Okay, good. Have you looked at the evidence? Yeah. What would it be another quick response to skeptic number one here? I also have trouble believing some of the miracles in the Bible. But if great. Exists, able to great. Our yeah, I think that's a great posture because that's true. I'd, maybe we do have, it's a fish, right? Not a whale. We have trouble believing that. <laughs> um, yeah, and so acknowledge that. Yeah, absolutely. Any other quick responses? Yeah, great. Okay. Excellent. That's a great way. And which one should we focus on? The resurrection. Okay, how about skeptic number two? I can't accept that Jesus actually rose from the dead. So now we are focused on that one. Quick response? Why not? Why not? That's exactly what I would say. That's, a, that's a, the perfect response. <laughs> Let's just leave it at that. That's great. Okay. Um, okay, uh, why do people... Why, why is it so hard to believe in the resurrection? This is not going to be new. It's more review now that we've kind of go, gone over that. But it's, it's worldview issues. You know, it's, it's worldview things that, that I think often keep people from belief in the resurrection. So the first, uh, I guess, number one on your structured notes is naturalism. Naturalism begins with the assumption that miracles are impossible because they violate, what, the laws of nature. We've already looked at that with Hume. And of course, we've looked at responses to that as well. You know, you, you could talk about how there's good reasons to reject naturalism. Uh, you, there's, uh, ev and oh, you could also say <laughs> evidence for miracles counts against naturalism. So, so much the worse for your naturalism. So, there's all these ways that we can, um, that you can engage this that hopefully you've, you've uh, learned a couple uh, so far. So that's one reason, it's just we have these naturalistic anti-supernatural biases. I think that's probably the main reason. We just, we just have this anti-supernatural bias, which just, just sounds weird. This one is sometimes still out there, this historical skepticism. Since we lack direct access to the past, we lack neutrality in our evaluation of the past, we can never be so bold as to say, this is the way it was. And then I see I gave you extensive uh, replies there. But, so the response is, yeah, we have no direct access to the past, you're right. Uh, but we do have a residue, residue of the past events in the forms of testimony and circumstantial evidence. That's the gist of it. Look, we have testimony. We have eyewitness testimony. We have circumstantial evidence. What do you do with that? And so, and then you, could, you, you have all this other stuff, but let's see, the illustrations. George Washington. So if somebody's skeptical about, if somebody says something like, you just can't know anything from the past, that's just way too long ago. Well, say, well, do you believe in George Washington? And then ask them why. 
And they'd probably say things like, well, because I've been to Mount Vernon, and I've seen his little tomb there, and I've got a $1 bill in my pocket, and there's a picture, you know, or whatever, or things like that. And, um, and so uh, and I've read accounts of him crossing the Delaware, and I've got a picture in my office of him praying next to uh, the Delaware or something on a horse. Um, so he, therefore, I believe that he exists. Um, and the, the, the point is, well, if you believe that, well, have you looked at the evidence, circumstantial, testimonial, for Christ? You know, and by what standard would you um, reject that if you accept that Washington is a, a historical figure? Pick Lincoln, pick whoever. But, you know, so there's kind of this, it's this kind of arbitrary, well, yeah, of course I believe George Washington, but I'm not going to believe Christ because that's too far away. Well, that's, that's pretty arbitrary. Or the Holocaust would be the other example. You know, some, there, I guess there are, there are Holocaust deniers, um, but, you know, if you're going to say that the Holocaust deniers are wrong, well, then, then you can know the past. And so, if somebody says you can't know the past, say, well, do you think the Holocaust happened? Well, of course it happened. Well, if you think it happened, well, then, then you don't deny that we can know things about the past. Therefore, we can know things about the past. And let's look at the evidence. So, these are just, you know, quick things that people might throw out, but there's no really good reason. Yeah? You, could they say that, you mean? I mean you mean if you're the postmodern, if you're yeah. talking to the postmodern person? Yeah, if I was talking about the postmodern person, if their belief is that truth is relative based on cultural context, uh-huh. then could there, well, how would they argue for the proof of miracles if it's okay for it to be true for somebody back in ancient times to believe in miracles? Um, I'm not quite sure if I'm tracking, I'm sorry, but um, I, if they believe that truth is relative, well, I would probably engage that first and, sh- and maybe help, because you know, you're not going to get very far if all truth is relative, because then who cares about facts, historical facts? Um, so that would be the first thing. And is that enough? I'm, I'm yeah, no. Gotcha. Okay. Got you, yeah. And so they're, they're, that's just exposing um, the self-referential nature of the postmodern claim. Okay, thank you. I, I, didn't, I, I got you now. Yeah. So point that out. And that's, that's the thing that you do in dialogue. That's why we need to learn to be good listeners um, and good thinkers, so we can spot those, those contradictions or problems. Okay, so anyway, those are a few things. The third uh, reason maybe why it's rejected apart from the evidence would be this idea that I think some people hold that most religions... You know, it's this claim that other religions have mir- miraculous claims. And some even speak of, of dead men rising kinds of things. And, and so they'll point to maybe ancient religions or, or, or things like that and say, well, see, the Christianity is no different. It's not unique, so I don't even care about it. I'm not even going to look at it. Um, in fact, they'll say things like, Christianity just borrowed this idea from some ancient cult. And, and uh, if you've heard that line of thinking, I think Bill did a good job in the chapter. If you read, there's about three or four pages where he talked about that. Um, and so it just points you to that where there's really no good reason um, to think that that's actually the case. For, well, for a whole host of reasons, uh, that's problematic. Also, if you're interested on that particular one, because I have had that kind of a discussion with folks before, there's a chapter in The Case for Christ by Lee Strobel, uh, the chapter by Edwin Yamauchi, where he, Ed, Edwin is a, he's a friend of mine, he's a really uh, good guy, he's um, like a world-class scholar, he knows 22 ancient languages, this guy's brilliant. And he, uh, in that chapter, he walks, he walks through all those that claim, you know, is this just borrowing from mythical ancient religions? And he walks through and says, no way. If, if anything, it's the other way around, where they're, they're parasitic on Christianity and the resurrection. So, okay, this just set up, uh, nothing to whatever. Any questions so far or thoughts as before we jump into the evidence? Um, implication is there's nothing unique about Christianity's claim because, you know, it's just one more resurrection kind of story. And so we don't need to even look at the evidence. So, Okay. Yeah. Um, I would, I would, so there's uh, in the chapter, let me see if I can find the page uh, right now. Bill talks about two quick responses that I think would be helpful. Um, hold on one second. One is that they're not parallel. 
So for example, um, see, I'm not going to find it talking to you here. Let's see. Yeah, here it is. It's page two. I, I would respond the way that Bill does on page 248. Number one, he says uh, the claim that these are, par that these are parallel um, things, you know, same instances is false. And he gives some, some reasons why they're not parallel. And then the second thing he says, also on page 248, um, there's no causal connection between the pagan myths and the origin of the, of the disciples' belief in the resurrection. And so the claim is that you have these pagan myths and that's why they expected to have a rising savior. And Bill does a good job and Edwin in the other chapter does a good job of showing, no, if there is beliefs, resurrection-like beliefs in any of these other cults, well, it's, it's because it's the other way around. They're, they're, they're stealing from Christianity, not vice versa. So that, that would be the two, uh, two things that I would say, and it's right here pretty well. Okay. Yeah, Milton? Is it common uh, that skeptics are attempting to disprove uh, what is in the Bible one, to not use the New Testament uh, or Bible period, and two, um, when these other groups come about to become parents, Okay. Yeah, so first question, was it common that uh, people are skeptical of the Bible without really looking at the Bible? Yeah, I mean, it could be. Um, some people have genuine worries with Scripture, but a lot of times it's just a, hey, this is what I hear, and so I'm not going to bother. So it's just an excuse to not even take seriously the evidence. I, I would think that's probably fairly common, but not, not all, all the time. And in terms of the parasitic thing, I would say all of your cults are best understood as cults of Christianity. They're parasitic on Christianity. So Jehovah Witnesses, they take, um, you know, they take some of the good and they slightly change our view of Christ. And so you get modalism, which is a heresy of the ancient church. You know? And so, same with, so too with Mormonism. They take another uh, view of Christ and switch it a little and you get uh, tritheism instead of monotheism, which is you know, a heresy, heresy of the early church. Um, and so those, I think, would be cults of Christianity, at least going forward, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, so what is the evidence that Jesus Christ resurrected from the dead? You've got this on your structure notes. Uh, 12, piece, 12 pieces of evidence, 12 facts agreed upon by, by virtually all critical scholarship, whether conservative, whether liberal. Um, you know, these are things that most scholars agree actually happen. And that's pretty significant. Uh, Gary Habermas says that 75% of all scholars, liberal, conservative, agree of, uh, on all of these facts. Now, these actually happen. There's some that will squabble on various facts. Um, let's just, just let me read through them and uh, kind of, I don't know, let it sit, sink in a little bit. I know these are familiar because we've grown up, you know, reading the, the passion account. We've grown up reading these things. But just, just think about these things. These are facts, historical facts that people agree on. Number one, that Jesus died due, the, due to the rigors of crucifixion. It's a fact. So how do, we, you know, how do we account for these things? What best explains it? Two, he was buried in a tomb hewn out of rock. Now, of course, for example, number two, not everybody agrees. Uh, if you've heard of the Jesus Seminar, uh, this was a group of scholars that uh, was prominent, or at least making a lot of noise, probably 10, maybe 15 years ago. And one of the leaders was a guy named John Dominic Crossan. And John Dominic Crossan would disagree with number two. He would deny it. Uh, he believes that Jesus was either left on the cross uh, after his death to be you know, torn apart by wild beasts, or he was just thrown in a shallow pit uh, where dogs would have probably consumed the body. So that's John Dominic Crossan. He denies uh, number two. Um, but most people agree that it's a fact. Why, why does he deny it? Uh, because he needs to deny uh, an empty tomb. He's got to get away from that one, because if you have an empty tomb, well, there's no good non-naturalistic explanation. And so he just denies that fact whatsoever. And so if he denies that, he's going to deny that it was buried in the first place. So Jesus' disciples, number three, despaired. That's a fact, over the death. Uh, four, the tomb in which Jesus had been buried was discovered to be empty just a few days later. So he denies four, and that's why he also denies two as well. And he gives some kind of a, a story about that. Uh, five, the disciples had real experiences that they believed were actual appearances of the risen Christ. Six, as a result of these appearances, the disciples were transformed and even willing to die for the truth of these events. These are, again, these are significant pieces of evidence or facts. Number seven, 
the message about the resurrection was at the very center of the preaching of the early church. You can see that all throughout the book of Acts. Um, look at the messages that Paul or Peter gives in Acts. Eight, the gospel message was proclaimed <clears throat> even in Jerusalem, the city where Jesus had died. That is, a, that is not an insignificant fact either. Uh, number nine, the Christian church was firmly established by the disciples. Number 10, primary day of worship changed to Sunday, the day Jesus reportedly rose from the dead. How do you explain that shift from the Sabbath, sun, sun, Saturday to Sunday? 11, uh, James, Jesus' Jesus's previously skeptical brother, was converted when he believed he saw the risen Christ. That's, you know, I love Bill had an extended discussion on that in the book that you read today. That's pretty significant. I mean, your brother, suddenly, who's skeptical of you, now believes that you are the Lord. <laughs> Think about your siblings, you know? <laughs> That's pretty significant. And then last 12, Paul, a leader in the persecution of the church, was also converted by a real experience which he believes to be the risen Christ. And that, by the way, is not insignificant either. There's, we'll watch a video in a minute by Mike Lacona where he says, that's like Osama bin Laden converting from Islam and going back to his own Saudi Arabia and trying to convert people to Christ. That's how cre that's, Paul was a persecutor of the church. He was killing Christians. He was stoning them. He, was, you know, he, he talks about in Philippians 3 that, that I was impeccable in my credentials as a Jew. And yet there he, that, but yet he, he is transformed by this vision of Christ and he begins to follow a risen Christ. Okay, so those, that's, those are pretty significant facts. Any reactions as you kind of sit on that? You know, we've heard these, but as you reflect on this a bit, yeah. What, um, when we, which is Habermas, say the majority of scholars, what they mean is ma the majority of biblical scholars. So conservative, liberal, people that are studying the New Testament text um, that are biblical scholars, so, yeah. Are all those scholars then holding the scriptures in the No, no way. Some are Jewish. Um, but they believe mm -hmm. the Bible. No, they believe that these, they don't even believe that, just that these facts actually are historical, okay. yeah. So the conservative ones might believe, might have a robust view of scripture as in inerrant and inspired, but, but not the liberal ones, um, and so on. Mm -hmm. And of course, this is not everybody. You're always going to have people that disagree. But a majority of people hold these facts. Okay, uh, what I'd like to do then in our discussion is take one of these 12 facts. And this is what I do. Again, there was this really good follow-up years ago um, that somebody did that, that, that has made its way into the crusade resources that I've used for a while. Um, and it just takes one of these facts and kind of asks the question, what best explains uh, this detail, what, what best explains this fact? And the fact is the fact of the empty tomb. And so this is how I talk people through this. I think the empty tomb is a great uh, one to focus on. How do you explain that the tomb was empty? What best explains that when you look at all the evidence, the circumstantial evidence, when you look at the testimonial evidence around it? And it's, it's quite compelling. Uh, Bill talks in the book about five lines of evidence, and you've got this in your structured notes. Let's see here. Yeah, so maybe I'll just briefly go through some of this just so we can have it before us as we begin to consider possible explanations. So here's the five lines of evidence. He talks about, number one, the significance of the burial fact. Uh, if the account of his burial, burial were true, then both Jews and Christians would have known where the tomb was. And then this leads to an empty tomb because, number one on your handout there, the disciples could not have believed in Jesus' resurrection if the corpse was still in the grave. Number two, no one would have believed the disciples if the body was still in the grave. And of course, the Jewish authorities would have exposed it as a fraud by opening the grave. Um, so the significance of the burial facts leads to an empty tomb because of these factors. And we'll come back to that when we try to explain this. Uh, let's see, second line of evidence that, that will be relevant. There's facts about the burial itself. Um, Joseph of Arimathea. He talks a lot about, the, you know, it's a real historical figure uh, here, a member of the Sanhedrin, uh, of the 70 member, the Sanhedrin is a 70 member Jewish uh, Supreme Court, I guess would be a good way to explain them. And, you know, so people believe it could hardly be fictitious um, because we're talking about a real thing with real people that you can, you know, that, and actually we've met Joseph of Arimathea um, 
before, I think, as well, as well as, well, as, well as Nicodemus. Um, okay, so there's facts about the burial that you can read about. Then the tomb was probably discovered empty by women. We've talked about that a bit yesterday. You can see in your structured notes, so this, uh, this is kind of hard, I think, probably ladies to read these kinds of things, but this was kind of the mindset of you know, the ancient Near East at the time. And so you see that quote from Josephus that uh, women are not qualified to serve as legal witnesses. Let not the testimony of a woman be admitted on account of the levity and boldness of their sex. Not very nice, but that's the view. Um, so legally, not, they could not serve as legal witnesses. Uh, they occupied a low rung on Jewish, the Jewish social ladder. You can see the, um, some of the rabbinical texts there. Um, again, hard to read, ladies, I'm sure. But, uh, but this is the reality. So you have low social status. You have inability to serve as a legal witness. And then it, so with that, it's amazing that they, women, were the ones who discovered the tomb empty. And it's interesting, though, if you go to the book of Acts. So in the Gospels, the women uh, discovered the tomb empty. Have you, do you notice or notice this next time you read through Acts? When the disciples preach about Jesus raising from the dead, they never mention that women discover the tomb empty. Why? Because they, that would hurt their case. They don't mention that. But in the Gospels, it does. And so, again, uh, that shows, because of this criterion of embarrassment that we talked about yesterday, that it actually probably happened that way. Uh, last, one, two, three... The fourth, uh, the disciples could not have preached the resurrection in Jerusalem had the tomb not been empty. And then there's this little, last little thing that's really interesting to me. I've always liked this passage. You guys want to turn there if you have your tablets? Uh, Matthew 28. Um, let's just look at this. Matthew 28, 11 through 15. Again, it's these kinds of things that we just sort of maybe glide right over because we're so familiar with the passage. But this is a, this is a significant fact that needs to be uh, taken into consideration. Matthew 28, 11 through 15. While the women were on their way, some of the guards went into the city and reported to the chief priest everything that had happened. That is, the Roman guards that were guarding the tomb. When the chief priest had met with the elders and devised a plan... They gave the soldiers a large sum of money, telling them, You ought to say, His disciples came during the night and stole him away while we were asleep. So this is the very first conspiracy theory here. The disciples stole him away. If this report gets to the governor, we will satisfy him and keep you out of trouble. So the soldiers took the money and did as they were instructed. And here's the key. And this story has been widely circulated among the Jews to this very day. So that reveals that Matthew, the author of the Gospels here, was trying to refute a widespread, remember, um, Matthew, remember the audience for Matthew was Jew, the Jewish community, and so he's trying to uh, refute a widespread spread rumor um, or a widespread Jewish explanation about how to account for the empty tomb. So they didn't deny, and what's significant? They didn't deny that it was empty. They're already trying to explain it away, and you, you don't want to miss that point. You wouldn't try to give this explanation unless the body's gone. And so that was the first option. Okay. Uh, let's, watch, uh, let's watch a video here. You guys good? Any questions? All right, Gary Habermas, New Testament. Talk about the empty tomb because Tabor says there were two graves, and uh, everybody's got a, a version on this. Of course, uh, Bajan says he didn't die at all, so he escaped and went down to Egypt and then over to France. And uh, I'm just saying, talk about the actual data in the New Testament that shows he was buried. Yeah, and Craig's done a lot of things on this too, on the burial, but uh, I, I recently counted virtually everything in print on the resurrection French, German, English, and what came out of this is 23 different arguments for the empty tomb cited by recent New Testament scholarship. This is an amazing number of arguments. By far the most common one is that women report this, and the idea is if you're going to make up a story in the first century and, and by the way, it's not true what you often hear, women could not testify. They could testify, but oftentimes there's an inverse relationship between how important the data are and whether you use women. The more important it is, you don't use women. Now, if you're making up a story, you don't use witnesses on this important fact where the audience is going to say, used women. Why does each of the Gospels cite women? Because women were the ones that went to the tomb. Now, that, that has impressed a generation of scholars, but you also have 
what I call Jerusalem factor. If you're going to make Jesus raise from the dead, put the tomb in Turkey. Put it somewhere else. Not in the city where the church is born, where a Sunday stroll could determine where the grave is open or closed. You also have enemy attestation. You also have multiple attestation on the empty tomb. They do, contrary to a few New Testament scholars, the New Testament empty tomb texts are not dependent on Mark. We have three or four independent attestations here to the empty tomb. This is heavy stuff. And you know, one, one of the favorite comebacks of the critics, some of the more further left critics, I'll say, well, hey, your own source tells you that they didn't preach the gospel for 50 days. Come on. After 50 days, you'd not recognize the body. I say, wait a minute, whoa, 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 whoa. This is a moot point. The Gospels did not proclaim, we have a tomb with an unidentifiable body. And since it's unidentifiable, it's not Jesus. No, their claim only works if there's no body in the tomb. And anybody could, uh, uh, you know, confirm that with a Sunday afternoon stroll in Jerusalem. So don't put it in Jerusalem and don't use women. The exact two rules they disagree with, plus multiple attestation plus enemy, we're on the road to a, a, good, a good factor. And by the way, the vast majority of New Testament scholars, about 75%, if you count them, about 75% concede the empty tomb. Okay. Thoughts, questions? If you listen to that? Yeah. Why it's an agreed fact? Because, um, I mean, that kind of testifies to an emotional state. Yeah. I mean, I think they're probably just reading some of the text where they're hiding in, you know, the upper room and things like that. And, and you know, when people, when leaders die, you know, that's what, that's kind of state we're usually in. And they seem to be acting in that way. And so I think it's probably inferences and putting together the circumstantial, circumstantial evidence and saying, yeah, that's probably, in fact, true. Yeah, I think it's, you know, it's not exact science, but that's the kind of thing that you do in real life, and that's what you would do I I with this, too. Yeah? And would that be because it would be embarrassing to have leaders who despair? Like, I mean, you know, I mean is that one of the reasons that it's a fact? scholars can accept it as fact? Like, there it is in all the Gospels, and if you were making it up, you might paint a better picture of them. So therefore, they probably were. Yeah, yeah, I think it's that criterion of embarrassment is probably in there. I mean, their leader just died, and uh, yeah, that, that, that's probably true, you know, that they would be cowering and things like that. Yeah, I think that's good. Mm -hmm. Gabe? Yeah, I was going to say, maybe it might also come into play that they actually thought when someone died, they were dead. Yeah, like that's they probably had, true. They, they, they had the realization that when someone dies, that yeah. they're dead, and they don't come back. So dead men don't rise, yeah. So they're like normal. Yeah. Yeah. Like yeah. 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 I mean, it's just a natural response, and so maybe maybe it's not such a. So why is why is that a fact that we highlight as one of the twelve? Well, it's because of the hallucination thing here. So what they're going to do is say we got to explain that fact and say that's why you have hallucinations. People that are grieved are are um, you have propensities to psychosis, and so the disciples are so grieved that they're hallucinating the risen Christ or something like that. So, yeah. So we got to explain it, and that's one way that they try. <coughs> Wouldn't uh, people who question the Bible's historicity use this as like a, like a rebuttal? Like, oh, see, this, uh, this was a possibility that the, that the body wasn't around, and they wrote this to counteract that. the rumor. Yeah, you mean the Matthew 11, uh, 28, 11 through yeah. 15 thing? Yeah, I mean, you could, I think that could be a plausible pushback. Yeah. Oh, yeah, you just put it in there because you're, you're the winners. But again, we'd have to go back to, then you just have to go back to all that work we did yesterday against the Bauer hypothesis. No. We have good reasons to think they're telling the truth. They're able to tell the truth. The they, criterion of embarrassment, um, you know, the incriminating evidence. So we're going to be, that's pretty arbitrary to say that, you know, if they're so painfully, and in fact, you guys have heard, have you guys heard like um, in archaeology, just to double click on that, in archaeology today, um, a lot of times people say, you know, when we're doing archaeology in the Middle East, we have a, an, a, a shovel in one hand and the New Testament in the other. Because they've come to trust that when it talks about cities, when it talks about things in the New Testament, it is as you find, you know, it says in the text. And so the question is, if Luke, for example, is so painfully accurate and, and painstakingly careful to get his historical facts right, well then by what leap 
of faith are you going to say that he's going to be careless with things that are of utter, utter, utter more importance, like our spiritual destinies, you know, and those kinds of facts. So, you know, so the evidence, the best explanation is that no, it's, this is history. They're doing history. They're, they're narrating the truth. So. Okay, so um, what happened to the body? There's, the, the tomb is empty. What happened to the body? So there's all these, so what I would do is just say, okay, you've got this fact, the empty tomb. Well, what are your options? And on your structure notes, you kind of see we've got, I broke it out into old theories and then new theories. So you have the naturalistic explanations where you try to explain it away. And then you've got, of course, the supernatural explanation, which is the one that, where Christ actually did raise from the dead. But here's some old ones. Uh, the first old one, which is the one you just saw in Matthew 28, is the conspiracy theory. And that is either that the disciples stole the body, the Romans stole the body, or the Jews stole the body. And here I would just walk through the evidence, walk through the circumstantial evidence with somebody. And I would say that the disciples lacked both ability and motive. So let's look at the evidence. And if you look at it, they didn't have the ability, nor did they have the motive to steal the body. What do I mean by that? Well, with ability. Um, it doesn't fit with, the, to say the disciples stole the body uh, of Jesus, it doesn't fit with what we know about the lives of these men. Uh, they were not dishonest men. In fact, uh, honesty was taught as a great virtue. So Peter, think about in, in uh, 2 Peter, he denies the charge that they fo followed cleverly devised tales. Further, on the night of the arrest, if you go back to that night, they didn't even understand that Jesus was going to die, let alone that he was going to raise from the dead. And they didn't know what to think when they first saw the empty tomb. And they were confused. And they actually hid because they were afraid of the Jews. And so uh, these are not the kinds of men who, boldly, you know, who would go out and boldly steal from a heavily guarded tomb. It just doesn't fit the facts. And of course, you know... Um, if you read in Matthew, if you still have your tablets on there, um, Matthew 27, verse 65, it says, um, Pilate said, Take a guard. Go make the tomb as secure as you know how. And so they went and made the tomb secure by posting the seal on the stone and posting a guard. And a guard is 16 soldiers who stand back to back in groups of four. And um, if they abandon their duties, it's under, under the penalty of death. And so are the, do the do these 12 disciples who are cowering, who seem to be men of virtue, really have the ability to, to overcome you know, this Roman, highly trained, lethal uh, force of 16 soldiers? No. It just doesn't seem plausible. Does that make sense? Are we okay? Um, was there something about Jewish culture that they were so afraid that they put the Roman guard out there that they were so afraid somebody was going to make an attempt at the grave? Or what exactly were they afraid of? Why did Pilate do that? Um, I'm just looking at the text. Uh, otherwise, so give the order for the tomb to be made secure until the third day. Otherwise, uh, the disciples may come and steal the body and tell people that he has been raised from the dead. This last deception worse than the first. So evidently they had some. Oh, well, this is the Pharisees. The Pharisees had suspicion, you know. I'm not sure, actually. Does anybody know? That's a great question. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Good. Yeah. I mean, that might just that might just be it. Um, he was even he even said that to the as I'm thinking about uh, when he's being interviewed by the high priest and he say, you you know this house will raise itself in three days or something like that. So yeah, maybe maybe it's just connected to that. I'm not sure. That's good. Yeah. Yeah, that's what Bill mentioned. Yeah, it's, uh, sure, it's possible. Uh, anything's possible. Uh, but again, you just go back to, does that really fit with the evidence about what we know about them? Do they really have that kind of ability, given their high value for honesty and you know, the fact that they were cowering in some building that night or whatever? Yeah, so is it possible? Sure. Plausible? I would say no. So that, that would be my quick response. What's that? If they knew they was in there, why would they put guards? Well, I mean, yeah, so maybe the guards were just guarding an empty tomb because it was sealed or something. Yeah, maybe the stone would be open or something, so that doesn't seem... <laughs> yeah, so again, it starts, it starts not sounding very plausible. But let's go, but even if they had the ability, so, so say that you grant that. Maybe they stole them before the guards got there on Saturday. Well, do they have motive? And I think that that's even as compelling as well. Um, think of it this way. If they stole the body, 
Well, it, it's kind of what we said yesterday, that it doesn't make sense, um, because then they would, we, how, what happened to the 11 out of the 12 disciples? They were martyred. For what? For belief in the resurrected Christ. So we know that people die for lies, but they don't die for things that they know to be a lie. And so it just, it, it lacks motive. Why would they all die these horrendous deaths um, as martyrs and none of them ever recanting? You know, Peter was crucified upside down because he said, I don't, I don't want to suffer the same twin, sin twice of denying my Christ and I'm not worthy to be crucified like my Savior. You know, why would you do that if you, if you were just making this up? And so, again, it doesn't seem to fit with the facts. Okay? Only, the only thing that explains the transformation of the belief of the disciples is that he actually rose from the dead. So that would be what I would say. Uh, whoops, hold on. What about the, the Romans? Did the, okay, so fine, the disciples didn't steal the body. What about the Romans? And here you would just say something like this. Well, they lacked motive as well. Uh, maybe the Romans stole the body, but again, why? Why would they steal the body? They had nothing to gain, number one. Uh, second, of, second of all, remember the penalty for falling asleep on duty is death. St actually, stripped of your clothes, burned alive by the fire started by your own clothes. That's, that's the penalty of, of having this tomb be empty. So, so certainly the Roman soldiers didn't have anything to gain from that. And secondly, if they did have the body, well, then why'd they accuse the disciples of stealing it, you know? Um, furthermore, uh, Ro the Romans did not steal the body because they gave it to Joseph of Ar Arimathea. So, it's just, they lacked motive. And, and actually, you'd say the same thing for the Jews. Uh, they had no motive to steal the body, and if they stole the body, they could simply parade it out, you know, in front of Jerusalem the minute the followers of Christ began to proclaim himself risen. Of course, they never did that, and so it doesn't fit with the facts. So just kind of walking through the, the text and saying, how, what best explains it? And none of these conspiracy theories explain it. And that's why this one is largely discredited uh, today. Okay, how are we doing? What if we, let's see, let's do, let's do one more and then we'll take our break. Um, so how, let's look at the next one. Old theory number two, the apparent death hypothesis. This is what's called, it used to be called the swoon theory, if you've heard of that. And it's the idea that Jesus never really died, he was always alive, he, and he just passed out. So what do you guys think? How does, that, how does that fit with the facts that we know? Okay, yeah, stabbing with the spear to make sure he's dead. What's that? They didn't break his legs because he was probably dead at that point. Good. They're, Roman soldiers are experts at this. They do this all day long. They know death when they see it. Uh huh. When they stabbed him, water and blood came out. Okay, and signifying. That after death. Okay. Okay. Yeah, pierces the pericardium in the heart or something like that. Yeah. Uh huh. It's kind of like with the empty tomb. These guys are motivated to finish the job. Good. Yeah. Yeah, that would not be good if they didn't kill him off. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. No. Now. I would just say nobody considers this plausible today, um, and you can just kind of talk through the kinds of things you've already said. You know, it hardly seems likely that a man, and you can just go all the way back to the beginning of his trial, a man beaten beyond description, I guess, have you seen The Passion of Christ? You know, Mel Gibson tries to portray this, pierced by a spear in the side, dies of suffocation, buried in a hundred pounds of linen for three days, so all of these things, could he mysteriously evade death, strip off the linen, roll the tomb, defeat the guards, and appear as, you know, a holy, pretty healthy, resurrected Christ? You know, it just, nobody thinks that that's really realistic. Um, it sounds like a miracle, yeah. So, so if you're going to hold to the swoon theory, you've just backdoor believe that Christ is God or something. I don't know. Yeah, it just, it doesn't fit with the facts. I mean... That's pretty hard to do, I would think. So, so nobody really believes this, but this, is, this was a view that was popular about 120 years ago. Um, somebody advanced this, and it had some noise for a while, but then you begin to examine the actual what's involved, and it just doesn't seem likely. <laughs> so naturalistic explanation number three that uh, used to be more prevalent is this wrong tomb theory. So back to your notes here. Uh, maybe the disciples got it wrong. You know. Uh, so, what do you say to this one? 
<laughs> yeah, you know, that's always struck me as like the obvious. Well, then if that's not the right doom, go, go to it. But they didn't. Um, so, I mean, there's, there's other problems, right? So that theory is, is way too simplistic. Because remember all those burial facts that we had? Joseph of Arimathea was, you know, put Jesus in his tomb. Well, if they went to the wrong tomb, well then... Just ask Joseph of Arimathea, this Jewish leader who could have simply taken them over to the tomb and showed them where he was in fact buried. Of course, the Roman guards were there, so you thought they could probably tell them you know, where the tomb was as well. And, and even if they did go to the wrong tomb, well, that doesn't account for other facts like the, you know, the, the post-resurrection appearances of Christ and, and so on. Um, and so it just doesn't do a good job explaining the facts. It just seems wrong. So most people, you know, that's a quick one that you would set aside as well. Okay, so those are your old theories. Uh, now there's three live ones today, uh, and this would be the most prominent one, this first one, the hallucination hypothesis. Have you guys heard this before? You know, the empty tomb and the subsequent resurrection appearances were just hallucinations. That's kind of weird to say the empty tomb was a hallucination. I don't quite get that part. Um, I can get, I understand saying that... Uh, you know, the uh, post-resurrection appearances are hi 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 uh, hallucinations, but how do you hallucinate the empty tomb? That's a little weird. Um, what do we say to this? What, uh, what, how could you respond to this current naturalistic hypothesis? Yeah. I can hallucinate. It's easy to hallucinate an empty tomb. I can see that. Okay. Happening. What doesn't happen is that nobody else takes Good. part in your hallucination. Yeah. Okay, good. That's very, I'd like to ask you more in a different context. Very interesting. <laughs> so, very good, though. Thank you. Yeah, they're, hallucinations are notoriously individualistic. They're not community hallucinations. That, that would be the main point there. That's really good. Okay, anything else? Yeah. We wouldn't just go back to, they could just pull a body out of the tomb. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that would seem to be pretty important. Yeah. Okay. The most important thing in response is exactly what was just said. Hallucinations are very individualistic and extremely subjective. Uh, it's a psychological fact that two people cannot have the same hallucination at the same time, let alone how many people? 500 people at the same time. And not only that, it can't explain the physicality of the appearance. So it'd be one thing to say, I have a vision, you know, so Bill talks about a distinction between having visions and appearances and things like that, but it's really hard to explain the physicality. They actually thought that he was physically um, present uh, with them. And then the last thing with the hallucination theory that's really hard is this whole idea of the Jewish mindset um, that Bill talked a lot about, that the Jewish mindset wasn't one of an individual resurrection. It was, the mindset was one of a resurrection of all at the end of the age. And so it's just really hard to... Uh, you know, take that, take it seriously. Given all those things, especially that first one. Yeah. It's even more of a stress for James and Paul. Too. Yeah. Yeah, because just because they weren't sad that he died. Mm -hmm. I mean, James might have been right. He was a little skeptic. Yeah. So That's true. Yeah. So James wasn't a follower <laughs> in, during his life. Paul certainly was even w further along. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, you're right. Yeah, so there's no, in that case, actually with James, he could still be sad as his brother or something, but with Paul, there's no grief there. Yeah. So, yeah. Well, combining the, the, the physicality piece along with the reliability of the New Testament uh, for the uh, gospel accounts, they touched him. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, yep. Right. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah, if the gospel accounts are reliable, um, it'd be hard to say those are just hallucinations. They're physically touching, having conversations, yeah, cooking fish, and all that stuff, so, okay. Yeah, so that's, but it's, it's a live one that's out there. I think Bill mentioned in the book that the scholar, uh, he's a German New Testament scholar named Gerd Ludemann, uh, that Bill has debated before. He does hold to this theory as you know, the, the one, and that's how he explains it. This one is interesting, this, this second new or current theory, this reinterpreted resurrection, this is very postmodern. Uh, this was, would be the Jesus Seminar, if you've heard of the name John Dominic Crossan, who I mentioned earlier, or Robert Funk, or Marcus Borg. These are, new te uh, these are scholars, scholars uh, that are Jesus Seminar people. Um, 
Here's what Borg says. You see it on your structure notes. When I use the word resurrection, I'm not saying anything about a physical body or empty tombs. When I say I affirm that the resurrection really happened, I mean the followers of Jesus continue to experience him as a living reality after his death. Jesus is a figure of the present and not of the past. After his death, they experienced him as a spiritual, non-material, but actual reality. So um, what they're trying to do here is, is uh, make a distinction between the Jesus of history and the Christ of faith. And you, you, if you read any of the Jesus Seminar stuff, that's the, that's the distinction. And even Boltman, remember Rudolf Boltman? Making a distinction between the Jesus of history and the Christ of faith. So you can experience the resurrected Christ as some spiritually resurrected being, but he didn't physically, literally raise from the dead. That stuff's false. So you pull apart and make a distinction like that. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yep. You're right. Yeah. So it wouldn't fit with the kinds of things that Milton just said. Yep. Yeah. But it's a, it's a way to it's a way to um, reinterpret all the evidence, you know, and try to make sense of it. Ah, oh, we just mean not a literal empty tomb, but you experience an empty tomb. You experience a risen Christ. You know, and the the Christ of faith. It's meaningful to you. It's true for you. You know, something like that. It's out there. It's out there in these people's readings. Um, you know, I'm not sure, uh, you know, maybe it's persuasive to some, but it, it is out there. So it kind of fall apart at the point where, well, this is really true for me, I feel this, but yeah. I mean, not in a spiritual way, but in my stomach, and I'm getting ready to die, well, you know, I don't feel that anymore. Yeah, it's subjective. Yeah, I, actually, if you wanted my biggest, I mean, there's lots of problems with it, but I would just say, look, you deny all the facts, you don't explain them away. You're, it's really not an account. Right? So you're just denying all the facts. And so now they're in a way minority of all the New Testament scholars. And that's why I think the Jesus Seminars, um, I, well, they shouldn't be taken seriously, but I'm not so sure they actually are being taken seriously anymore. Because they're, not, they're just not in the mainstream, even with liberal scholarship. Last one, which I guess this is where I would go, um, you know, is just, just be agnostic about it. This was Anthony Flew. Uh, E.P. Sanders, uh, that Jesus' followers and Paul had resurrection experiences is, in my judgment, a fact. What the reality was that gave rise to those, I do not know. That's probably, to me, the best not naturalistic explanation out there, it, which it isn't an explanation. It's just saying I'm not willing to follow the evidence where it leads is what it actually is doing, though, right? Uh, Anthony Flew was this, you know, who just passed away. Um, he was an agnostic. He just wasn't willing to can see that these kind of miracles could happen. So, don't know. I don't know what to do with that evidence. I see it, don't know what to do with it. And at that point, you know, what do you do <laughs> if somebody's like that? Well, if they're not willing to listen to reason, then it's not reason that keeps them from Christ. So, that's what I would, that's where I would go. Is, is the, interview, the interview that you have on the very first page, page 74, from Anthony Yes. Yeah, um, well, he thinks it's the best, he thinks it's the best attested, but he just, you know, he's not going to make, he just doesn't think it happened. I don't know what to say about those things. So, you know, I think that's still consistent, what he said on the front and what he says here, or his actual view. Yeah, those are, you can put those together. You're admitting that, that it's the, if I were to believe in miracles, I'd be a Christian, but you know what? I don't know what to do with that, so... Okay, so you look at all these naturalistic explanations, and we've got six here, and then you say, well, which one best explains the evidence? And to me, it's pretty clear that it's this one. The best explanation for all the evidence that we've looked at of the empty tomb is that he actually rose from the, get, from the dead, that Jesus literally actually rose. And of course, if you have good reason to believe that God exists, well, then there's no reason why it's not possible for Jesus to raise from the dead. So these are, again, it comes back to that. Well, maybe you just have an anti-supernatural bias. Maybe you just don't want to go there because you, you know, you're, you're naturalistic or something. That's usually what's going on. It's not the evidence that keeps people um, from that. Okay? Okay, that's it for the empty tomb. Any uh, last thoughts, questions on this? Uh, Bill likes to talk about two other facts. Uh, and so... If you ever listen to a debate or if you read some of the stuff that's not quite as convoluted as the chapter you read today, um, he'll, he'll basically, he'll say, look, there's three facts that, need, that uh, most 
scholars agree on, the empty tomb, the post-resurrection appearances of Christ, and the origin of the Christian church. Or, I'm sorry, the, yeah, the origin of the Christian church, or more specifically, the origin of the belief in the resurrected Christ. And so he just says, look, what best explains those facts? And, um, and he'll argue that the best explanation for all of that, of course, is the resurrection. Welcome to the One Minute Apologist. My guest with us today is Mike Lacona, who is an author and sought after speaker. He has co authored a book on the resurrection with Gary Habermas. It's good to be with you, Mike. Well, you too. Thanks. Hey, listen, if you could just help us to understand this idea of the resurrection, we know it's been under attack ever since it's happened. Well, I think the first thing we would do is we would look at some facts that would be so strongly evident that they would. Uh, they have convinced nearly every single scholar who studied the this, this subject to regard them as historical facts, including skeptical ones. That would be things such as Jesus' death by crucifixion, that subsequent to his death that Jesus' disciples had experiences that they interpreted as Jesus appearing to them risen from the dead, and that these occurred in individual and in group settings. And third, that there was a skeptic, a persecutor of the church named Paul, who converted to Christianity when he had an experience that he believed was of the risen Jesus appearing to him. Now this would be like the modern day Osama bin Laden, who has an experience and then converts from Islam to Christianity to his own demise and preaching to the Muslim world, didn't get stoned for it. This is kind of like what we're looking at with Paul. So now as historians, what we want to do is we want to come up with a hypothesis that will best explain these three facts. And we would do this, uh, determine which is the best hypothesis by saying, which one accounts for all three facts, uh, rather than just one or two, which can account for them without bending them or forcing them to fit like a square peg in a round hole. And third, uh, what can we do it without any, uh, what hy which hypothesis does it best without any non-evidence assumptions? And the resurrection beats the others hands down. So for example, the leading naturalistic explanation, hallucinations, it can account for Jesus' death by crucifixion. It can account for the appearances to individuals, but not the group appearances, because hallucinations are not group phenomena. And it can't account for the appearance to the skeptic Paul, because he wasn't in a state of grief. So I mean, you could kind of force those to fit, but then you'll lose explanatory power, because you're forcing them to fit. With resurrection, all three fit very easily. If Jesus rose from the dead, it explains his death by crucifixion. Why numerous people in individual and group settings believe they saw him risen from the dead, and why even a skeptic saw him risen from the dead. So historically speaking, forget, you know, assuming that the Bible is trustworthy in any manner, just taking the facts upon which most everybody agrees on, you can come to the resurrection of Jesus as the best explanation, and thus we should regard it as an event that occurred in history. The resurrection of Jesus took everybody by surprise. The disciples weren't expecting it. They knew perfectly well if you followed somebody who you thought was the Messiah and he got killed, then that was it. We know of at least a dozen other messianic or prophetic movements within the hundred years either side of Jesus. They routinely ended with the death of the founder. Um, and if, they, if the movement wanted to continue, they didn't say, oh, he's been raised from the dead. They said, let's find his brother or his cousin or somebody who can carry on this movement. We can see how those Jewish groups did that. This one did it differently. They had James, the brother of Jesus, as this great leader in the early church. Nobody said James was the Messiah. They said Jesus was the Messiah. Why? He's dead. He, they, they got him. Didn't you realize they crucified him? No, he was raised from the dead. The only way you can explain why Christianity began and why it took the very precise shape it was is, let's say it cautiously first, they really did believe he was bodily raised from the dead. And then if you take the second question and say, why would they believe that? You can go through all the theories that they found themselves forgiven, that they had a fresh sense of the presence of God, that this was cognitive dissonance, etc. And you bring all those theories to the actual facts that we know on the ground from the first century. They just don't fit. The only way you can explain the rise of the early Christian belief that Jesus was raised is that there really was an empty tomb, they really did meet Jesus alive again in a transformed body, and the thing makes sense. Of course, when I wrote a big book on this, my philosophy tutor from Oxford, who was an atheist, um, uh, read it, and he said, great book, you really make the argument, he said, I simply choose to believe that there must be some other explanation even though I don't know what it was. I said, fine, that's as far as I can take you. I can't bully you into saying, therefore, you must believe. 
because to do that requires a change of worldview. But once you change the worldview and say maybe there really is a creator God and maybe this creator God really is sorting out this sad old world at last, then everything else makes sense in a way that it doesn't with any other possibility. Okay, so um, there's a couple videos, N.T. Wright, you know, really eloquent and well stated there. I love this quote from Keller. This will be from, uh, this is from your reading. Take away Easter and Karl Marx was probably right to accuse Christianity of ignoring the problems of the material world. Take away Freud and he's probably right to say Christianity was wish fulfillment. Take it away and Nietzsche, Nietzsche probably was right to say it was for wimps. But of course, if it happened, if it really happened, well, then it's true, and that changes everything. That's what he says. He says, if the resurrection of Jesus happened, that means that there's infinite hope and reason to pour ourselves out of the needs of the world. Let me, um, if we could, we're going to get done early today. That's good. Um, or we could go back and fill some stuff up if you want, but um, my guess is you're probably tired. Um, so let me just end with a story, if that's okay. And the reason why I want to share this with you is it, because it really double clicks on the resurrection. And why it's so extraordinary. And so I want you to think about the gospel as a three-act play. And the three acts would be tragedy, comedy, and fairy story. So the gospel is a three-act play. <coughs> tragedy, comedy, and fairy story. So I want to connect this to uh, some things I said earlier in the week or last week about the point of story. But uh, there's this great little book that I'd highly recommend to you by an author named Frederick Buechner. Um, it was, it's, it's called uh, To Tell the Truth. And then the subtitle is the gospel is, comedy, uh, the gospel is Tragedy, Comedy, and Fairy Story. A little book you can read in like three hours. But to me, one of the most impactful books in terms of just uh, understanding the gospel and the depths of the gospel. His name, again, is Frederick Buechner. I think it's spelled like this, Buechner. Anyway, this is what, let me tell you what Buechner says. So tragedy, this is what he says. Let me read from his book. He says, tragedy is the news that man is a sinner. To use the old world that is evil in the imagination of his heart. That when he looks in the mirror, all in a lather, what he sees is at least eight part chicken, phony and slob. That is tragedy. And so if you think, and we've been talking about that. We, one of the defeater beliefs is, is this idea that the world is not the way it's supposed to be. Something has gone drastically wrong. And this is man's tragedy. And of course, we have to start with tragedy, right? Something has gone drastically wrong. And, okay, so that's the first thing, the gospel. That's like act one. Act two is this thing, comedy. So what is comedy? And this is what Buechner says, I love it. He says, the tragic is the inevitable, but the comic is the unforeseeable. So the comic, so comedy is an unexpected turn, the unforeseeable. He says, how could Donald Duck, he's a great writer, how could Donald Duck foresee that after being run over by a steamroller, he will pick himself up on the other side as flat as a pancake, but alive and squawking? How can Charlie Chaplin, in his baggy pants and derby hat, I know some of you, uh, you know, I know who he is, I think, but, uh, <laughs> and derby hat, foresee that, the, that though he stood up, he was stood up by the girl and clobbered over the head by the policeman and hid in the kisser with the custard pie, that he will emerge dapper and gallant to the end, twirling his invincible cane and twitching his invincible mustache. So comedy, it is the news that, in spite of ourselves, we are loved anyway, cherished, forgiven, bleeding to be sure, but also bled for. That is comedy. And so, so what is comedy? You know, we have this, uh, in our culture, we have this, such a shallow view, I think, of comedy, you know. But, but there's such a thing as high comedy. What is high comedy? Well, it's the, uh, it's the unforeseen. And when we laugh, it's the unforeseen, right? It's the unexpected. That's what makes us laugh. And what's interesting is that I think there's div divine comedy all throughout the great story of God in Scripture. There's the, there's the unforeseen all throughout Scripture. And it's funny, um, I was thinking about this. I remember I, I was able to play the comedian in my wife's life early on in our marriage. And so this is an example. Um, so, you know, this is, uh, I think, our first year of marriage. We were living in Cincinnati at the time. And uh, my wife was out shopping in the morning. We lived in this little, like, it was a four like an apartment that had four apartments, a little house that had four apartments in it. And so I was sitting there waiting for her to come back. 
And as I was sitting there relaxing and she was shopping, uh, all of a sudden I heard this loud bang and the apartment shook. And I knew at that moment that my wife was home because um, I knew immediately that uh, she had announced her arrival by driving my nice new, uh, it was actually a Honda Accord, into the side of the apartment. (laughs) And so she had announced her arrival there. And what was interesting, so Ethel had grown up, uh, whenever she'd break a plate or some furniture or something like that, she would experience ridicule by her, her parents. And I knew this about her, and I also knew that she would feel, that that was what she expected from me uh, as she walked in, you know, basically scratching up the side of, our, uh, of this car. And for whatever reason that day, you know, maybe it's because we're early on in marriage or whatever, um, <laughs> it, you know... Uh, Maybe it's because we didn't have kids yet, and so we hadn't experienced the joy of having everything you own broken, but for whatever (laughs) reason, but for whatever reason, that day I was able to play uh, the comedian in her life, and so when she walked in, I just saw her face, and she knew it. She expected me to be angry and to be, you know, to have derision and to condemn her, but it was actually kind of funny, and so I started laughing, and, um, and At that time, we'd actually coined a phrase, we called them ethylisms, uh, where she does stuff like that. And so it was just one of those, one more of those ethylisms uh, that she had. And at that moment, I knew as she walked in and we began to laugh about it, that she had experienced high comedy, you know, the unexpected turn. And this is what God does to us all the time. I love this in scripture. Think of like Psalm 73. You know, this is the Psalm Psalm of Asaph where he's complaining like, look at the wicked and they just have everything and they have no worries. And then there's this unexpected turn where he says, but then, but then I consider their destiny, their eternal destiny. You know, it's this unexpected turn. And then he concludes with, it is good to be near God and, and all these things. Uh, think of Ephesians, you know, Ephesians 2, 1 through 10, that, that wonderful passage that you all do in your Bible study methods class. And there's this unexpected turn right in verse 4. You know, but God, who is rich in his mercy. This is unexpected turn. You see those all over the place. So what's cool about Scripture and this is what I would say to you, but I would, I would certainly, I would, we would want to say this to the people that we minister to. It's really important that tragedy doesn't get the last word. In our lives and in their lives, tragedy does not get the last word. Why? Because God is a divine comedian. So, what is the divine comedy that is a response to man's tragedy of the gospel? <clears throat> it's the incarnation. The incarnation is the unexpected turn That who would have thought that God became man and sends himself down, you know, to become one of us? And if you think about that, that's pretty crazy. It'd be like Lewis entering Narnia, you know, as a a talking animal, undoubtedly, or something like that. Or it'd be be Tolkien um, going to Middle Earth as a hobbit, or or whatever. It's just, it's, it's crazy. It's this unexpected turn. But then, the tragedy of Christ's life is the crucifixion. And then the divine comedy, again, is the resurrection, you know? And so it's because of the resurrection, um, it's this unexpected turn, it's this high comedy, and it's because of that that now we can have this third act, this fairy story ending. So let me me tell you what uh, Buechner says about fairy story endings. He says about fairy tales, he says, what gives fairy tales their real power and meaning is the world they evoke. He says it's a world of magic and mystery, of deep darkness and flickering starlight. It is a world where terrible things happen and wonderful things too. Yet for all its confusion and wildness, it's a world where the battle goes ultimately to the good, where, who, live ha- uh, let's see, who live happily ever after, and where in the long run, everybody, good and evil alike, becomes known by their true name. And so that's fairy story. <clears throat> and the thing about fairy story is that they're, they're never ending. So you have unexpected turns, but you don't have endings. You know, you have comedy, but things never end. And that's the beauty of the gospel, isn't it? And so I would just say, you know, if we, as we think about the gospel as man's tragedy, uh, divine comedy, and fairy story, this is the gospel message. And of course, right in the middle of that is this unexpected turn of the resurrection. The resurrection is high comedy. That's what it is. Who would have seen it? And that's how, that's how subversive it is. That's how crazy it is. That's why it's sometimes hard to believe. It's high comedy. We would never have expected it. So last question, and we can be done. We can be done early. And I would ask this of ourselves. 
but I would ask this of those that we minister to, is, is there a story that understands you? Is there a story that understands you? Is there a book that's alive? And of course, we know the answer because this is not just the great story of God. This is just not the gospel. This, this is the story of our lives, right? The tragedy of our own life is that we're, we've sinned. And the comedy is that God has reached down into that to save us so that we can enjoy the fairy story ending. So is there a book that's alive? Is there a story among all the competing stories? And of course, there's lots of stories that compete for our allegiance in the culture, whether it would be you know, finding our identity in sports or other people or relationships or success, whether it would be worldviews that compete for our allegiance. There's lots of stories that compete for our allegiance. But the question that I would ask are, do any of those stories understand you? But this story does. Why? Remember, go back to what we said earlier. Because in this story, we meet the point of the story. We meet the logos, the person himself, um, <clears throat> you know, who has accepted the tragedy of the sin-shattered world and of our human hearts and has embraced this comedy of divine love by sending Christ and by raising from the dead. So that is the joy of the gospel. And that is the miracle, I think, of the resurrection. Let's pray, and we can, we can have a little break since you've worked so hard this week. God, thank you that there is a book that is alive. <clears throat> thank you that there is a story that understands me. And there's a story that understands each of these brothers and sisters in this room, Lord. Lord, thank you that in that story we meet you and that you call us to yourself. And thank you that there's comedy. Like, Lord, we love laughter. We love comedy. And it's because you created it. In fact, you modeled it in sort of the most pure way with the incarnation and the resurrection. And Lord, thank you that because of the resurrection, you have torn this hole between the way the world is and the way the world ought to be. And that we can live in hope. We can live in trust. We can live in dependence. That one day, everything will be made right. And that one day, good and bad alike will be known by their true names and that we will worship you forever. And so I, do, I, I pray, Lord, that we would be people who embrace the gospel, that we would be people when we communicate the resurrection, that it wouldn't just be about these facts, which are, they're out there, but Lord, it would be the excitement of the comedy of it, the unexpectedness of it. Thank you that you died for us and that you rose from the dead. We love you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.